Well, ladies and gentlemen, you will be aware, of course, that we live in a very consumption-dominated society. But you may not be aware of how much your consumption impacts upon resources. So to give you an illustration of how our consumption has impacted upon resources in the last 100 years, here are some headline numbers for you. Since 1900, we have consumed construction materials at a factor 34 times faster than in 1900. We've consumed ores and other minerals 27 times faster, fossil fuels 12 times faster, biomass 3.6 times faster. On an average, we've used up resources eight times faster than we did in 1900. Now, there were 1.6 billion people on the planet in 1900, and by 2000, that had changed to 6 billion, so an increase of 3.75. So you can see that resource use has outstripped population growth by a huge amount. What does that mean? Well, in 1900, we could comfortably source all the resources we need from the Earth. By the time we got to 2002, just over 100 years later, the rate of consumption meant that we actually needed, at that rate of consumption, more than planet Earth was able to give us. By 2015, which I still hope to be alive, and many of you, I'm sure, hope to be alive as well, we will be using two planets' worth, and by 2,100, four planets' worth of materials. But that assumes current consumption rates. And of course, consumption rates have just been going up and up and up, with no sign of reduction in growth. This has enormous social, economic, environmental, and of course, political consequences. And I think, and a lot of other academics also think, that we need to start addressing these issues now. Now, we started using resources seriously when the Industrial Revolution kicked in. And of course, that's towards the end of the 18th century. And there have been several waves in which resource use has changed. The first wave involved mechanization, second wave, the use of the railroads and the textiles and the growth of commerce. The third wave, which is only about 100 years ago, just to get some context on this, was fueled by the development of the internal combustion engine, which, in case you didn't know, was only developed in 1896. There were only 25,000 cars around about 1900. By the time we got to 2000, there were 530 million cars at a conservative estimate. The next wave of resource use occurred after the Second World War, when we had electronics, space, aviation, petrochemicals coming in. And then, of course, more recently, we've had the fifth wave, which has all been about the IT revolution. We're probably on the verge, or maybe just at the beginning of the sixth wave. But there is a difference between this wave and all the previous ones. Because all the previous ones relied upon cheap, raw materials. That is not going to be the case for the sixth wave. If you look at the price of raw materials, they've gone steadily down over the last 100 years. Until the last couple of years when they've started to go up significantly. And those of you who've seen your litter bins removed in Southampton and melted down would be only too aware of that. Now, the European Union in 2010 recognized that this was going to be a significant problem. And it identified 14 potentially critical raw materials, which you can see listed behind me. Except that it's not 14 because PGM stands for Platinum Group Metals, and there are lots of those, platinum, gold, and silver. And then the rare earth metals, there are 17 of those, including, for example, neodymium, without which you wouldn't be hearing me because it's in microphones and loudspeakers. It's in the hybrid cars that we use. And it is gonna be vital if we're going to develop wind generators, 
with a magnet made of neodymium. If we don't have access to these raw materials, we can't continue with our current rate of consumption. We can't have the telecommunications that we want. We can't generate the next generation of energy that we need. And so, this is important because what you can see on the map behind me is that the vast majority of these raw materials come from politically unstable countries, war-torn countries, or countries that deliberately stockpile these materials and don't release them to us. And so there has to be another way of getting resource security. So let's look at a, a something that we're all familiar with, the radio invented in 1895 or thereabouts, on the work of Maxwell and Tesla, Hertz, and of course Marconi. And this has been developed from a crystal set to a vacuum type device, to a transistor radio, to a digital radio. And of course, we've had the digital switchover te for television in the UK recently. We're gonna have the digital radio switchover. The switchover for the television in the UK 10 million plus TV sets discarded. There are many more radios out there. Mobile phones, there are currently more than six billion on the planet. Two years ago, there were only 4.8 billion. So their growth has increased enormously. In the 1980s, they weighed 10 kilograms. Hardly anybody used them, had low functionality, maybe used 10 materials. Now, they weigh Less than 100 grams, they use more than 60 metals and have enormous functionality. Things are increasing apace. A tablet, a modern tablet, is a fantastic device. Look at all the things it can do. When I was a lad with my record collection, my LPs, I needed two bookcases worth of space just to store my 10cc albums, okay? I don't mention Donny Osmond, okay? I needed a whacking great big stereo and speakers. The whole lot can be stored on a tablet, along with everything else you can think of. That is amazing dematerialization and convergence. Dematerialization means that we use less resources to have the same use of materials. But the thing is, how many of you have still got a tablet, a PC, a laptop, a mobile phone, a Kindle, and so on? It doesn't happen in reality. What we need to do is we need to mimic nature cycles. Nutrients develop plants, which we eat, and then we die, we're decomposed, we form nutrients, which form plants, and so on. We need to have the same cycle for our waste materials. We need to make sure that instead of digging materials out of the earth constantly with all the subsequent health and environmental impacts and of course the moral and ethical issues, we need to mimic that cycle. This process is known as urban mining where we can get the um, elements and metals and so on from anything, construction materials, uh, IT and so on. So for example, uh, a, a typical Prius a Toyota Prius contains 2.2 pounds of neodymium. Take a huge amount of energy and effort to get that out of the earth, but you can just get it straight out of the car and use it again. So in this system, you minimize the amount of raw materials that you use. You minimize the impact of the mining of these materials on the earth. You enable obsolete materials to come back into the value chain. So here you can see you dispose of your materials, they're collected, they go to a central point, they're separated out by some mechanism, they're then mined, they go back to the manufacturers, they come back for use where we use them again. We can skip the mining step and all the subsequent impacts. It's not quite as straightforward as that because whilst the um, a dismantling process and the materials recovery process has high efficiencies, actually the collection process has a low efficiency. 50% uh, on that slide gives us a 34% recycling rate, but 50% is quite high in reality. 
Here's a piece of work that was done by my colleague Francis Ngondo and I, looking at students. And I know there aren't many in the, in the audience, so you won't be interested in this. But we looked at four countries, 26.8 million students. They had 37 million stockpiled, stockpiled mobile phones between them. Why is that of interest? Well, in one ton of gold ore, there might be five grams of gold. In one ton of mobile, waste mobile phones, there's between 350 and 500 grams of gold, plus all the other rare earth materials. If I was a miner, I know where I would be mining. <laughs> there are other impacts, um, which you will have seen, I'm sure, on the television. Um, when you get, when you use your material and you dispose of it, typically it goes to Asian countries where it is dismantled by cheap labor in terrible conditions, often in their kitchens, often outside, using crude devices. They are subject to toxic emissions. The environment is subject to contamination and so on. You only get maybe 25% recovery of gold under those circumstances and nothing else. Whereas a modern system will get you 95 plus percent recovery of gold plus all the other metals that go with it. So, I know what you're thinking. This blue sky thinking is fine, Ian but it's never going to happen in practice. There's too many vested interests. There's too many big companies. There's too much inertia. This is academic pie in the sky. In fact, you're probably thinking that you'll be seeing pigs flying before it happens. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a pig fly, but sometimes it does occur. A group of academics, of which there are some in this audience, across Europe and one in Taiwan, got together with some industries, and we formed the Zero Win Project, which stands for Zero Waste in Industrial Networks. And I'm proud to say that the vision for the Zero Waste in, in Industrial Networks in Europe was written in this university by me and my colleagues. And this is one of the mind maps that we generated, which shows the blue sky academic pie in the sky thinking. That was converted into a real industrial network. We're working with the most difficult sectors you can imagine, construction and demolition, automotive, IT, photovoltaics. And this shows the uh, industrial network for uh, MicroPro computers in Dublin who have made this, the I Am Eco D4R laptop. Now that, device is made out of scrap pallets, ladies and gentlemen. It has the same functionality as anything you buy in your local computer shop now. Retails for the same, or will retail for the same sort of price. It has 61% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, 89% reuse and recycling of materials, 55% reduction of freshwater usage. It is the world's only Class B computer, which has been awarded an eco label. And the guy who devised it, who I'm proud to call one of our colleagues, Paul Ma, was uh, awarded the Eco Bear Award uh, in November for his contribution to sustainability and environmental protection. And we have done this sort of work in the construction and demolition sector, in photovoltaics, and in the automotive sector using big companies, Hewlett Packard, Continental, and so on. So it is possible to turn academic pie in the sky into reality. It is possible to turn one person's waste into another person's treasure, or to quote a well-known band, <coughs> into inspiration. So ladies and gentlemen, next time you see a flying pig, your eyes may not be deceiving you. Thank you very much.